Hello. I changed the name. It's a little lame, but it'll have to make do. I think it most accurately represents what it is I'm trying to do here. I've talked before about short stories on the channel and the role of short stories within the um within the greater artistic medium. I think the role of short stories is uh, mostly to inspire and to maximize quality density. Uh, simply put, it's very easy, well, it's not very easy, it's easier to sort of make this compact, small story that's really good than it is to stretch that quality out over hundreds and hundreds of pages. That said, my favorite short story, I think the one that I've the, the one that's come closest to making me cry, and in fact I could imagine myself crying to this at uh, certain, certain depending on my mood, is Isaac Asimov's The Last Question. Now, um, if you've read it, you probably know why. I've linked it in the description, because I think everyone should take a read of this thing. It's really, really good. Um, it's not necessarily the most well-written short story. It's not like some roll Dollyan, you know, big story with a twist, although it does have a twist. Short stories usually have a twist. But it's just the most thematically complex, I think. What it has is, uh, it, it has that whole theme of, of human transcendence and, and transhumanism and, you know, us, us, uh, us becoming greater than what we currently are, whilst at the same time keeping this sort of soft, subtle nostalgia, um, feeling of nostalgia towards what's what we once were, or what we once would have been, given the context of the, uh, the tale. Um, it's it's kind of like it's it's there, there's there's a there's an uplifting component and a uh, a melancholy, uh, uh, a downer component, you know, Ozymandias melancholy or something like that. Uh, yeah. I'm going to read a quote from it. The stars and galaxies died and snuffed out, and space grew black ev after ten trillion years of running down. One by one, man fused with AC, each physical body losing its mental identity in a matter that was somehow not a loss but a gain. Man's last mind paused before fusion, looking over a space that included nothing but the dregs of one last dark star and nothing besides but incredibly thin matter, agitated randomly by the tag ends of heat wearing out, asymptotically to the absolute zero. Man said, AC, is this the end? Can this chaos not be reversed into the universe once more? Can that not be done? AC said, there is yet insufficient data for a meaningful answer. Man's last mind fused with only and only AC existed, and that in hyperspace. The reason I bring it up is because I want to talk about the concept of trans transhumanist stuff, uh, mega consciousness, he, different individuals fusing into one greater whole. That's what I want to call it. That's what the AC is. Uh, that's what it ends up being. It's a supercomputer, and these superhumans fuse with the supercomputer, creating one mega entity of supreme stuff. Uh, and the reason they fuse with it is to preserve energy and to try and find the answer to how they could reverse entropy, because, you know, after millions of years, this is the one thing that's really threatening the survival of, you know, their intelligence, of their species. Uh couldn't possibly say that these are humans anymore, but it's their consciousnesses, and the one thing threatening them is entropy, because as far as we know, that's the one law of physics that's, you know, always presenting an imminent danger, even if everything else can be solved, all human issues, you know, for, for millions and millions of years, this thing will still be an issue, so long as entropy increases and, and energy disperses outwards, that's still going to be an issue. Unless we figure out how to, like, create negative temperature, which, um, I mean, I don't know. It, theoretical physics, it's, uh, I, don't, I don't know enough about that right now, but yeah. So, it's a weird thing, because it's suggesting it's like, um, 
Entropy is like the ultimate villain in the universe. You know, the, the villain at, at past all other villains. Even if we defeat capitalism, even if we defeat, you know, all the evils and bastards and psychopaths and every problem and every alien species that wants to destroy us, everything that we'd ever do, we're still going to run into entropy at the end of the day. We're still going to run into this one thing that's going to threaten us. The only thing we can do is to figure out a way to reverse it. So I'm thinking super, super long term, what is the biggest issue that's going to exist for mankind? It's the issue of entropy. Um, it's sort of an abstraction at this point, because it doesn't really matter. This is billion, trillions of years uh, away. It's not even relevant to any human affair that, that exists today. But it's interesting, because ultimately things are headed this way. And it makes me theorize about what the real... What the real issue is with this is, is I think what, what every living being, what life itself, what evolution is tending towards is maximum complexity. Because what evolution is trying to fight is it's effectively trying to fight entropy. Entropy is maximum disorder, maximum randomness, you know, chaos. Whereas evolution is trying to build uh, structure. It's trying to build pieces and build more complex things out of those pieces. And... That is the antithesis to entropy, right? That is the antithesis to chaos, and that's exactly what it's doing. And from that perspective, a mega-consciousness makes perfect sense, because how else would you maximize complexity? You would fuse all living things together. You know, complexity is not about quantity. It's about, um, it's about sort of quality. Well, it's, a, it's about uh, complexity. I don't, I don't know how else to explain it, but it's, a, it's about combining things to make a greater whole not increasing the quantity of things you know it's not about making more humans it's about making one super giant human by combining the minds of different humans this all sounds like sci-fi nonsense but the thing is, is if you're you know really going deep with moral theories and and just the the, the philosophical value of this stuff you do have to consider this stuff and this is where i want to bring up a guy called ray kurzweil Ray Kurzweil, Ray Kurzweil, I don't know how to pronounce his name necessarily, but he's a futurist. He, he's a guy who predicts like what technology is going to end up being and, and uh, where things are going to head. He predicted the fall of the Soviet Union. He predicts a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and a lot of his predictions to the future revolve around us very transhumanist things. He, he's all for the singularity. He's all for us combining uh, with machines. You know, us becoming sort of more, you know, becoming one with, with uh, synthetic matter to enhance ourselves. That's what we're seeing already with our phones and computers are like brain enhancements, brain, brain extensions. That's what the Internet is. Uh, but he's taking this even further in a more literal sense, like robotic body parts and, and um, actually fusing our minds with, with like digital, uh, I don't know, just like... Uh, actual hardware that that could allow our minds to sort of exist you know permanently and uh, connected with that hardware we'd have like new senses and new ideas and a whole new way of thinking and this is not one of the reasons why when i talked about ex machina i was just like you know ai when we create full ai they're not going to come kill us and take over because at that point we'll just fuse with them you know if we could create a machine that's as powerful as a human brain at some point, we're also going to figure out how to just combine that with the current human brain and become like a hybrid. And that's why the, the singularity isn't worrying me. And that's why I'm fully embracing it just like Raker as well. But I'm going to read about his, um, I'm going to take, uh, read a little bit about his, his six epochs of evolution. This is his like, th this is a big theory and I, and I wholeheartedly agree with this. So there, he says that there's six major epics to technology evolution. Number one is physics and chemistry. At the beginning of the universe, all information exists at the subatomic level, right? That makes sense. Um, then at a some certain point, you have a biogenesis, and that's epic two, biology and DNA. With the beginning of life on Earth, genetic information was stored in DNA molecules, and yet organisms take thousands of years to evolve. Epic three, brains. Evolution produced increasingly complex organisms. The birth of the brain allowed organisms to change their behavior and learn from past experiences. So that's where we come in. That's where we are now. 
Actually, no, no, Epic 4, technology. Humans evolved into organisms with the ability to create technology. We are right now in the final stages of this epic. So this is what he's saying. We are in the final stages of Epic 4, and the next epic is Epic 5, the merger of human technology with human intelligence. Biology and technology will begin to merge in order to create higher forms of life and intelligence. And then we have Epic 6, the universe wakes up. The, this epic will see the birth of super intelligence and with it humans slash machines expanding into the universe um, and epic 6 is where we would see begin to see mega consciousness epic 5 we're probably not going to see mega consciousness we might see some hive minds that people decide to form well, for the most part people will just be walking around as like you know machine human hybrids and stuff and this ties into the last question completely because in Isaac Asimov, he, he go in the in the story he goes through several epics of like history where we go from just humans that have colonized space to like superhumans that are building planets to like super mega humans that are uh, doing whatever in the universe th that that's you know wearing out and, and dying of heat but it ties in precisely into that and these theories both seem to suggest that um, there will be some great merger uh, of intelligences and of technology. This suffice to say there will probably be a merger of multiple intelligences as well, just because, you know, that's... just because that seems like the natural thing to... that would happen. That's how you maximize complexity, is if you constantly, constantly merge and merge and merge. Uh, so, it, as far as, like, reality is concerned, I think... And it's not about like hypothetical utopias, but a mega consciousness is almost completely inevitable. I don't see it not happening. In other words, I I can like I I can't imagine like unless the human race is destroyed. But if it's destroyed, then this whole process just starts all over again. And once again, we start from zero, and life is going to create more. You know, a biogenesis is going to happen. There's going to be life forms. There's going to be consciousness that's going to create technology and yada yada yada. And all the epics start all over again. But ultimately, it's headed towards this supreme merger of consciousness. And that's exactly what Ray Kurzweil probably thinks. And that's exactly what Asimov thought. And what's definitely what I think. Um, I talk about hypothetical utopias. I talk about things that might happen in between. And certain ways of organizing society that might be good without necessarily looking into the far far future where this grand synthesis is going to going to occur but um yeah i just want to this is highly likely is all i'm going to say in the far future i don't see this not happening at least for like the vast majority of people will fuse into a mega consciousness and if they don't fuse into a mega, those that choose not to fuse will be assimilated by force because, well, why wouldn't they be, you know? Because I think the idea is that the mega consciousness will have greater intelligence and hence more option. And so what it's going to be looking for is to make its intelligence even greater, which it would do by fusing with more and more humans. So there, would, there could literally be this Borgian attempt at just assimilating all other people even if they don't want it for whatever quasi-religious or nostalgic reasons, it's going to assimilate them anyway and turn into a mega-consciousness. We can't stop it, pretty much. It's, it's going to happen. If we do stop it and if we kill it, it's, it's going to emerge anyway because I think this is what evolution is just naturally tending towards. It's maximum complexity. Because remember what I said, what is evolution trying to fight? It's trying to fight entropy. These are the two forces that are actually clashing in the universe. It's complexity and disorder. And we happen to be on this side. Not by choice, we have to be on this side. I mean, we want to maximize our complexity so that we fight ultimate disorder, because disorder is ultimately the only thing threatening our existence. It's a fascinating, uh, just like, just deconstruction of, of this whole thing. And does this tie into the utopia thing? I think it does. I think it's relevant. Um, I think it's... I think it certainly puts things into perspective, and I think it, it certainly throws a wrench into certain theories that mischaracterize what evolution is actually doing, or pretend like evolution is... People have the tendency to say, evolution is just the survival of the fittest. It's like, well, what, what does that really mean, though? That's like... 
that that's an approximation of what happens in in biological evolution you know for certain time scales and uh you know but we're talking about you know that's something that happens locally, you know, to one species for short periods of time. The species that doesn't adapt will die, and uh, the one that does will evolve. Well, the one that uh, does, doesn't does die it has evolved. But what happens when you look at all species across all time is you, you could start to see a very different pattern. And what he's saying is you see a complexity-maximizing pattern. So that's interesting. This also ties into why I think art in general is about the best art is the art that has the best complexity, all everything else um, being equal. So I think this this it all go it all fits together very nicely. The one thing I want to just talk about a little bit is I think um, I I think that science fiction and uh, just popular culture and just people in general might very very much mischaracterize the nature of mega consciousness. Just like they may mischaracterize the nature of AI and the singularity, like I've talked about with Ex Machina. Um, the way they mischaracterize it, well, for one, I could talk about, um, I've heard this, this, this nonsense of people talking about how with, with this fifth epic, where we start to fuse with technology, what's going to happen is people will become more uh, emotionless how things are heading towards more rationality and less emotion. And that doesn't make any sense. Um, because they're viewing this, 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 this childish understanding that emotion and, and reason are like two opposing forces that are constantly fighting for supremacy within the mind. And the rational actor is one where, where reason has won, but emotion has lost. That's bullshit. That's not how it actually works, at least not how I see it. And I'm, I guarantee you, I don't know too much about neuroscience, but I guarantee you that the story is, uh, it's, the, the story is more akin to what I'm saying than what they're saying. What they're saying doesn't make any sense. Reason is not a, a motivating, directing force. It's not purpose-bound. Reason is just a tool. It's, it's a tool in a toolbox. It doesn't have a purpose. It's something you can use to analyze situations. It's something you use to slow think and, and be thoughtful, but it doesn't have a purpose. Emotions, one could argue, at least, you know, depending what we call an emotion, is, is the, the purpose uh, aspects of consciousness. They're the things that are, give a person their motivation. You know, their, their ability to set goals, their ability to have desires, their ability to respond to certain stimuli, their ability to have long-term goals and want to build things and create things and do things. That's, you could argue, all of that is emotional in nature. So what happens when reason gets in the way of emotion or, or emotion gets in the way of reason is um, one could argue that those are different emotions fighting for supremacy and one emotion wins over another. Or there's a stimuli that's very strong and it, the stimuli is so strong that the person forgets to use their the reasoning toolbox. But you can't ever say that it's emotion, Trump, reason, blah, blah, blah. No, that's not how it works. Um, or at the very least, you can't argue that the whole the purpose is somehow to overall eliminate all emotion, because that doesn't make any sense. If anything, with, with this increase in complexity, there's been an increase in emotional complexity as well, as we s could see from evolution. Like, chemi like chemicals and, and, and basic cells and basic organisms, they don't feel the same emotions that human beings do, you know. Um, Neither do most animals. Like reptiles probably don't feel love the same way that human beings do, or maybe they do, I don't know. But they certainly don't feel the same kinds of emotions. But the more intelligent that a living thing is, the more, you know, its emotions tend to be, you know, similar to what humans can experience. Um, usually it's a lot simpler, you know, but, sometimes, but the more intelligent they are, the more emotional they are, the more emotional complexity they have. So it's a complete fallacy to suggest that the goal is to eliminate emotion. That's a regressive point of view. If you want to eliminate emotion, you should eliminate intelligence, basically. That's what you, that, that, that's the way it makes sense. Intelligence does not go against emotion. You know, that's just backwards way of seeing it. You know, look at dolphins, for example. Most intelligent living things next to humans, and they're crazy. They, they can, they do, they, they're cruel, for one. They can be cruel, which other animals aren't, you know, necessarily as cruel as dolphins are, but that's because they have that emotional complexity to allow them to, you know, act 
in that particular way. So with humans, we have a greater emotional complexity than all other, other animals. And with this adage of the fifth epic, where we start to fuse with machinery and expand our brains and become transhuman, then we'll have even greater emotional complexity. If anything, what technology is going to do is it's going to allow us to experience, you know, more emotions, and it's going to allow us to experience to have new novel experiences and you know we're going to be able to think differently and have new ideas and we will have new emotions and new feelings and new ways of thinking that right now we can't even imagine because we're stuck within the human lens uh like it's we can't even imagine what it would look like what what that type of psyche would would resemble but it will won't necess it will necessarily be more complex than anything we have now so it will include even more emotions than what we have now. More emotional complexity. Is, think about it. It's, it's, other than that word, uh, there's no real way to describe it. right? But it's like it's the fact that we can it, be cruel and angry and, and loving and all these things that animals may not be able to experience because their brains are simpler than ours. You know? It's like compare that... You know, c compare animals to us, and then compare us to the transhuman superhumans, you know, and the lack of emotion that animals have is um, analogous to the lack of emotion we have compared to the superhuman, pretty much. So that's what you're looking at. You're looking for a huge jump and increase in, in the, uh, the complexity of the experiences and all the new possibilities that are going to happen. So, yeah, I don't see this as ever being... Um, they, they, people who say there's like trying to get rid of emotion that's just a, that's a stupid as fuck that, that's a fallacy and they're making a mistake and they're probably the same types of people they're going to say that um, they're not emotional which is why their perspective is right and that's bullshit um, anyone who says that is a liar they're just trying to mask their emotions so that uh, you don't start to use their emotions against them because they like to pretend that, that they're non-biased you know, uh, whatever. I don't want to get into that, but the point is, d emotions and um, reason are not counteracting forces. And this is why I get in trouble with sci-fi, where it has Vulcans and then the Borg, and they tend to be these sort of unhuman. They're more advanced, but they tend to be sort of anti-human. They just have, they lack empathy and they lack anything but reason. See, I think that's a fallacy. I don't think that. I'm not saying the Vulcans can't lack emotion, but they, they must have necessarily some emotion. Otherwise, they wouldn't have any kind of motivation whatsoever. They wouldn't have any desire to do anything or build anything. At most, you could say is that they don't have the same emotions that human beings do, but they would necessarily have to have some sort of replacement. And the next thing I want to talk about is just a little bit is I want to um, dismiss the fallacy that the mega consciousness hive mind would be anything like the Borg. Because that's the first thing that will fall into every, anyone's, any naive person who's watched too much sci fi that, like, oh, that's just like the Borg. That sounds terrible. We're giving up our humanity. Urgh. It's not going to be like that. Um, the, the problem with the Borg, I haven't watched all of uh, Star Trek Next Generation, um, and I probably should, but. The thing with the, Vor the Borg is the Borg are actually much less than human beings are, despite pretending that they're more. Um, and that whole assimilation thing I talked about, that's precisely what, how the Borg operate. But the problem with the Borg is that the Borg are not greater in complexity because they don't seem to, they don't exhibit the properties that a more complex being would exhibit. right? And part of the reason why it's like that is because they're not written accurately. Um, the people who wrote Star Trek, decent writers, but the problem is they probably, it, it's, it's impossible, literally impossible to conceive, to accurately conceive of a being that's more complex than us, right? It, it, again, it, it's like a dog trying to understand the intelligence of a human being. You know, we could do it, sort of, partially. We could partially parse through the intelligence of these greater beings, but we can't really conceive of them, you know, the way we can conceive of, s of smaller beings, more simpler ones. And the problem with the Borg is the Borg is exactly that. The Borg is, 
you know, a writer trying to conceive of a greater being, of a being that's supposed to be greater than humans, but portraying it as a being that's lesser than humans. Um, it's inaccurate. That's not what the Borg would actually be like if the Borg were, in fact, doing what they were doing. Um, again, this is just my preliminary understanding, given that I haven't seen all of TNG. If, certainly, the Borg could just be fucked up. They could just be messed up and... They might think that they're greater when, in fact, they're lesser. But in terms of complexity, let me point out, you know, wholeheartedly, they are lesser than human because they lack the emotional complexity. As I said before, with greater intelligence comes greater emotional complexity. It doesn't go away once you reach intelligence. That's a fallacy, as I just explained. So the Borg, this mega-consciousness, at least, the mega-consciousness that would be accurate, you know, an accurate portrayal of a hive mind, mega consciousness, or transhumans, humans fused with machine, you know, brains or whatever, would be, would have greater emotional complexity than human beings. They could experience and feel more things, things we can't even imagine. They could think things that we can't even imagine. You know, they could come up with ideas that we can't even fathom at this point. Um, so it's very sort of arrogant and naive to assume that we could understand such a being, one. And two, that such a being necessarily means that we're giving up our humanity. That this, this being would lack humanity. I don't... See, lacking humanity means it's like you're losing something. But that's not what's going to happen here. This being isn't going to lack humanity. It's just going to have something greater than humanity. As well as humanity. You know, it's adding on to humanity, not taking away humanity. You know, pe people think saying that's like technology dehumanizes blah 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 uh, certainly some of that might take place but I just think that's misusing technology and, and shallow vapid vain culture and capitalist bullshit you know that's not necessarily technology's fault technology is supposed to be and necessarily will be a positive force for change and um, a, a proper brain extension that will add to our humanity you know or <laughs> add extensions to our humanity rather than take away from our humanity. That's the way that, um, that's the way it's actually going to play out. You know, that's the only way it can play out. Uh, it doesn't make sense to say we'll take away all of our humanity because that's like reducing a, a mega consciousness to just a robot. You know, that's not what it's going to, that's not how it's going to work. It's not going to become lesser, right? When the Borg are simply lesser. You know, they, they don't want to do anything except assimilate. Again, I, I'm not totally sure how the Borg work because I haven't seen TNG. But that's pretty much what I keep hearing is that all they do is assimilate. And it's just like, you know, you are one of us now. And, and okay, what do I get to do now that I'm one of you? Oh, you get to be a drone and just walk around and assimilate more things. It's like they don't, do, they don't have any goals other than assimilation. They're effectively a virus. that They, they have the intelligence of, like, a bacteria not a human being, really. That's their overall goal. But this mega consciousness I'm talking about, at least the way Isaac Asimov describes it and the way Ray Kurzweil describes it, would not be like that. It would, and the way I'm describing it is, it wouldn't be like that. It would be greater. It would have goals and ideas greater than anything human beings would have. You know, I read an article about um, somebody trying to imagine, you know, how computers could do math. And some people might say computers are never going to, you know, do math theory the way we are. But that's that's naive. Eventually they will. You know, they will figure out a way to do math. Um, and the way that this author broke it down was he, it, it could go a number of ways. You know, for one, computers could, um, you know, they might not be the ones coming up with the theorems, but they might be the ones coming up with the proofs for the theorems by looking at random combinations of symbols. Uh, the, the computers might be the ones who, you know, do very long, elaborate, boring proofs of what are very important theorems, but the theorems themselves are things that human beings come up with. However, it's also possible that at a certain point the computers will be so advanced that they'll be actually coming up with theorems themselves, and that they will, you know, either Either we will come up with a theorem and the computer will prove it, but it will prove it in a language that is like a language that we don't understand, that we cannot fathom, or they themselves will come up with a theorem that we understand, 
but the proof we won't understand because the proof is in a language we don't understand because the computer gets it we don't or and not in the mean that we don't but we can't understand it right it's so like outside of the limits of the human consciousness that we can't even understand the language the computer would be using to make the proof and furthermore it's possible that the computer will actually come up with theorems and proofs where even the statement of the theorem we don't even understand the statement of the theorem however the computer will be convinced that the theorem is profound and important and it will tell us this is a profound and important theorem and we'll be like yeah yeah okay we believe you computer but we won't understand what the hell this theorem is even saying and how the proof looks so yeah the but I think the issue is like it's not something to be afraid of because at that point we'll just be fused with the computer anyway, so we will be able to understand this alternate language and you know the, this stuff that if we were just locked as regular humans, we would have no hope of uh, figuring out. Uh, the point is, you know, th that is an example of, of something that, that like it's possible that these computerized super transhuman mega consciousness whatever will be able to do things that we can't even fathom right now you know that we can't even conceive of it's so complex it's so outside of just the realm of human of the human lens that there's no hope of figuring it out and so that is the perspective that we should have when we look at the borg or when we look at um when we look at any kind of mega consciousness thing is that we don't actually know what this being would really be like because we can't fathom it we cannot fathom the possibilities that a being like this could have it could be dangerous it could be an evil crazy being but it could also you know be a very great being it could be like a god you know it could be all sorts of things we can't imagine it again it's the problem is that there is an there is a limit there is potentially a limit to what we can even conceive of here that's what you have to understand and if there's a limit to what we can conceive of then it's very foolish to come in and start saying like you know for a fact what this being is going to be like and it's necessarily going to be sort of less than human and it necessarily means giving up our humanity and blah 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 that's why i'm embracing you the singularity because i don't think it's going to be i don't think it's going to take away from our humanity i think it's just going to add in more and more and give us more options and, and more possibilities and it's going to be great um so the borg should think more of the Borg as like a virus and a bacteria rather than a race of superhuman, you know, because they, they don't have, like the Borg don't have any creativity either. They just have cubes and shit. They have no creativity. They have no spirit. They have no complexity, right? That's the whole thing I kept talking about. This mega consciousness, mega consciousness would necessarily have that, I think. It would, it would still be interested in art. It would still be interested in, I don't know, the human struggle. You know, it would still, the, like, the same way we perhaps are interested in the struggle of, like, uh, you know, dogs and plants or whatever, you know, biologists. You know, we, we're still interested in that, even though we're above that, right? That's what this organism was going to be like. It's still going to be interested. And moreover, it's going to be more intimate than that because this organism will know what it came from. You know, so it will have a, this nostalgic appreciation for history and what had to happen, what had to be sacrificed, and what pain people had to go through in order to get to this place, in order for it to be able to have the options and the, and the greatness and the possibilities that it does, it would, should have that type of evolutionary humility about all, you know, all the suffering that had to exist before it could come into existence. So I think that's kind of touching. So I don't imagine this thing ever lacking any humanity. I imagine it having more humanity than we could even imagine. And again, it would be still interested in art, still interested in science, still interested in math, still interested in philosophy and all that stuff, still interested in, you know, stopping entropy and, and the evils of the universe, still interested in, you know, trying to survive and trying to expand and trying to, you know, discover new things in the universe and figure out new things and learn new things and experience new things. It would be, like, basically human in every single you know parameter except that it would be more complex in each one its art would be more complex its math would be more complex its scientific understanding of reality would be greater than anything we could imagine its emotions would be more complex and more nuanced and more you know, sort of divided and more interesting um 
but that's what we're looking at. We're looking at more complexity, not less. So it's nothing to fear. It's overwhelming, I suppose, but it's not something that's evil or scary or wrong. And, um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. I don't know if this would be a hypothetical utopia, because it's not really a utopia, but um, mega consciousness. And please read the last question. I'm going to link that down below. Cheers, folks.